seems Lady Susan will finally visit. Lady Susan Vernon. That woman's a fiend. Congratulations on being about to receive the most accomplished flirt in all England. Excuse me for arriving this way. What a delightful family pose. Mrs. Cross has come with me as my companion to pack and unpack. And as there's a friendship involved, I'm sure the paying of wages would be offensive to us both. My brother-in-law is very rich. In one's plight, they say, is one's opportunity. Sir James Martin, vastly rich, rather simple. How jolly. Tiny green balls. What are they called? Peas. If my daughter were not the greatest simpleton on earth, she would be engaged to him now. But, Mama, I can see Sir James is a kind man, but marriage is for one's whole life. Not in my experience. May I present Lady Susan? Delighted to make your acquaintance. He's handsome, isn't he? In a calf-like way. Mannering's in town. Have you seen my husband? Horrid woman. Deranged. But if she were going to be jealous, she should not have married such a charming man. Does this woman always get her way? She has an uncanny understanding of men's natures. I can't help fear that Lady Susan Vernon would destroy every comfort of our lives. With pleasure. How ungentlemanly. I'm enjoying Sir James's visit to Churchill. Churchill? That's how you say it. All together like that. I'd heard church and hill, but couldn't find either. All I could see was this big house. <laughs> you promised that you would give up all contact with this woman. What a mistake you made marrying him. Too old to be governable, too young to die. Lady Susan. How dare you address me, sir? Be gone or I will have you whipped. Outrageous. Have you never met him? No, I know him well. I would never speak to a stranger like that. Hello and welcome to another edition of The Living Room, brought to you by Curzon Home Cinema. Uh, if you're watching this live, you can join us by sending in a question via the video post on Facebook, Twitter or YouTube. Just uh, include with your question, hashtag Curzon Living Room, and also let us know where in the country or indeed where in the world you're calling from. Love and Friendship, the fifth feature by Whit Stillman, is now playing on Curzon Home Cinema, and I'm delighted to welcome today Whit Stillman to The Living Room. Hi, Whit. Hi. Thank How you. are you? I'm okay. The internet just went out, but uh, it'll be back uh, in two hours. So I'll do this on the phone. Okay. And we, where are you currently? I'm in Boca Raton, Florida. Okay. And um, how long have you been there now? Just for quarantine. I, I have a daughter finishing medical school here. Right. And I did my quarantine here, which wasn't bad. Okay, um, love and friendship. Let's let's talk about the origins. When did you first think about adapting Jane Austen's Lady Susan? Well, it was actually um, I was in Paris reading um, Jane Austen, and and I had a sort of big Jane Austen project, and I encountered this unfinished uh, manuscript that she had left, and I was actually having drinks in London with a young theatre producer who was running the tiny. I'm not sure how you say it, German Street Theater. Yeah, German Street Theater, yeah. And um, he was looking to branch out to something, you know, beyond two people shows, three people shows. And so, well, I said this could be, you know, eight people or something. And um, we started talking about doing it as a play. And um, I really enjoyed talking to him, Trevor Brown, about it. He was, he was very helpful. Um, but, um, I really was frustrated with the play form and I ultimately wanted it to be a film. I sort of thought we'd do like the uh, Marx Brothers used to do where you tried something out on stage and then did it as a film. And I just wanted to go right to a screenplay. So I started, uh, but it was, it was sort of 10 years on the screenplay. And it's an epistolary novel and the structure, you know, to watch the film, it's, it's such a, a beautifully plotted um, film. Did you begin by trying to piece together this, 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 this novel into a screenplay or did you pick some key scenes and start writing the, the dialogue first? Well, um, now it's really good um, for public domain works that you can get um, editable text that you can work on. And so I had that and um, I could only work on the script when I didn't have a paying job. And so there'd be sort of years between when I could work on it. And I just kept sort of going through it, um, whittling it down, whittling it down to sort of the best um, dialogue and, and turning the letters between um, Alicia 
um, and Lady Susan into dialogues between them and started working out how, how that would work and how the plot could advance. And Trevor was very good about getting me to try to make um, the Frederica character bigger and different things like that. And so I was trying to sort of restructure it um, as I went, but um, it was just such great material to work with um, because often when things aren't finished, it's because they weren't very good. In this case, it was almost too good. It was almost too funny and too evil that Jane Austen ultimately didn't want to take it further. Um, but for, uh, for us, for now to work on, it was very good. Um, I remember seeing uh, Emma Thompson uh, years ago talking about writing the screenplay for her adaptation of Sense and Sensibility, which Ang Lee directed. Um, and she talked constantly about this great debt that, that, that she felt to the fans of the novel um, and, and Jane Austen and that it had to be absolutely perfect. Just wondering with Lady Susan, because of the fact it's not very well known, did you feel a sense of freedom that you could be more playful with, with it? Yes, I did. I, I, I sort of was very reluctant. Um, I was initially involved with, with that film, um, Sense and Sensibility, but the, um, the, the problem I found was to take a great finished Jane Austen work that I love as it is and turn it into sort of a classic comic book that can run in 90 minutes. In this case, the, the material is quite brief and it had never been sort of finished or put on the screen in any way. And sort of take it further away, um, from what people were expecting, I changed the title because Lady Susan wasn't a Jane Austen title. It was just something um, used by people to refer to it. She didn't put a um, title on it. And she actually, uh, uh, Northanger Abbey had been um, called Susan, um, the original title. And so taking one of her own titles from, from a, what I consider insignificant uh, juvenile story and using it for this. And, it, and it, I felt it worked for the material too, but it, that it did annoy some people using the um, earlier story's title for, for this piece. And you've talked about the length of time that you've been working on this screenplay, but just thinking back to your earlier work, for instance, if, if Jane Austen had been alive in the 1970s and had hung out in Studio 54, I have a definite sense that what she might've written about it may have ended up looking to a certain degree like the last days of disco. Um, how, how long have you actually been a fan of her work? Well, I hope it wouldn't have been R-rated. Um, <laughs> last Days of Disco is R-rated, which I always felt was a mistake. Um, uh, what was your question? Um, how, just how long you've been a, a fan of, of her work and, and, well, and this I made desire mistake, to do something. Yeah, Sorry. I made the mistake of reading the wrong thing at the wrong time. So very depressed in my second year in university. I read Northanger Abbey and thought it was just terrible and Jane Austen was overrated. Um, I have a literary um, sister, elder sister and brother-in-law who were her champions. And so I read Sense and Sensibility later, which I think is sort of the best starter um, Jane Austen um, novel if you're sort of a nonfiction person because it's very much dealing with ideas and, and, and intellectual content. Um, I think it's sort of the lesser of, of her four or five great novels, um, but it's a great way in and I became absolutely devoted to her. And that was like two or three years after university. I've got a question here from uh, Jen from Stirling in Scotland. Uh, you've written two novels that are linked to your films, both this and The Last Days of Disco. I was wondering if you consider yourself a writer who happens to make films or a filmmaker who enjoys writing, or is it a case of both? Yes, exactly. That's a good question. So I've gone back and forth between the two. I wanted to be a novelist and um, felt then I wasn't cut out to a solitary life and shifted during university my ambitions to doing something in television or film. And as sort of happened um, when I was working in publishing and journalism uh, after university and trying to find ways into film, um, the independent filmmaking started as far as we were concerned. I know it existed, for instance, in Spain and Madrid, they were making funny comedies earlier. Um, I suppose the French New Wave was sort of independent cinema earlier, but um, for us, it was John Sayles' Return of the Sokolka Seven. Here's a short story writer who sort of is taking a story and filming it with low means and 
and then Jim Jarmusch did his films, his first films, and Spike Lee did She's Gotta Have It. So it's the idea, okay, we can write you know, a script and do it ourselves. Uh, and so that became, but um, I never had the courage of doing something long. I'd been writing short stories and doing fiction that way, but I never had the courage to do a long form. So I felt with this screenplay of Last Days of Disco, I could expand that and make a novel of it. But each time there had to be kind of a trick point of view thing. And in the case of um, Love and Friendship, I actually had the um, contract to do a novel because people liked the script as something to read um, before we had gotten financing and arrangements to do the movie. So the agreement to do, there was gonna be a novel of Love and Friendship, um, uh, even if there hadn't been a film. Um, but the brilliant change for the film and also for the novel was what Tom Bennett did with the character of Sir James Martin. So Tom Bennett is a performer and it's actually the only part um, I don't think I've ever auditioned where there are three good actors for it. Um, they're really with good people for Sir James Martin, but thank heavens um, we had Tom Bennett because we had a really grisly read through um, at before shooting, it's really grisly. There are real problems and it looked like a catastrophe. And we had this fellow on a laptop. So we were, most of the actors were there in Dublin around a table and all that. And then there's this laptop and this laptop suddenly sort of appears and says things. And it was just so funny and just relieved all the tension. And so I immediately started writing more scenes for Tom and he, he's, he wasn't too pleased to get sort of eight pages of dialogue at, at seven o'clock in the morning. Uh, and, but that was the, the 12th commandment scene. And so with the idea of this Sir James Martin character, I had the idea for, idea for the novel, a similarly sort of dim but more pretentious literary nephew who's in love with his uncle's um, wife, Lady Susan. I'm giving it away, that's a spoiler, I'm sorry. Um, and then he writes a defense of her, sort of turning everything on its head. So the novel is just, there's so much facetious irony in it, it's almost like too much. It's just, if you like your facetiousness, absolutely straight with no no mixer, that's the novel. And, um, but it allowed me to get into a lot of things. So now with like all these controversies, like the Woody Allen thing, I, I think, gosh, the first 10 pages of the novel deal directly with this because um, it's because one a person has done one bad thing, it doesn't mean they've done every bad thing. And that was sort of the defense that um, this nephew had for his aunt. But just because she did one thing that wasn't quite right doesn't mean she did everything that was bad. I've got another question here from Adam Morling. Um, you create such a distinct uh, world in your film, first through dialogue and language and then visually. What was the process and conversations with regards to creating the look of the film? That was, I mean, because they're dialogue films, sometimes people don't give credit to those working on the visual side. Um, and John Thomas, um, the cinematographer for the first three films, he actually won um, an Independent Spirit Award for the cinematography of um, Barcelona. And I asked him, you know, about that. And he said, well, you know, in the city of Barcelona, you know, everywhere the camera looked, it was just so great. But we also had really good local production designer, um, sort of knowing exactly the right things to, to put in the movie and not have Sagrada uh, Familia and not have the, the total cliche things. We like some cliches. Um, and so um, I think in thinking of the subject, there's always a visual element. So the first idea for Metropolitan was really almost a visual idea. The idea of these young people, very dressed up, very anachronistic in these elegant um, living rooms, or maybe just one elegant living room. It would be sort of cream, ivory and gold colored. And um, it turned out to be at Christmas time. So the mother of one of the actresses who was donating the location, had her florist do it up in, in Christmas um, uh, decorations that were really beautiful. And so we, wherever we could, we tried to make something look really distinct visually. And of course, disco um, can be so beautiful. And the idea for that came out of the disco scenes in, in Barcelona. And you said that this film was shot entirely in Ireland? 
Absolutely everything. Um, and we try to make it seem like it could plausibly be where it says it's about. So we tried to be very, very selective about what we showed. And I thought of coming to um, near London to do some things, but um, really the 18th century has been preserved in aspic in, in parts of Ireland. Um, and it would have been hard and, and sort of pointless to, to try to come to England and, and add much to it. Uh, let's talk about another visual element of the film, uh, the use of, of text. First of all, the introduction of the characters at the beginning. Was that something that was in your script or did that develop later? It developed later and it's really thanks to the um, editor, Sophie Cora. So we were totally um, frightened of the opening shot of the film and how we were going to um, get that. And we allowed a lot of time for that morning. It was sort of a special location that we had to drive out of our radius and pay over time and we thought it was it snowed actually and are we going to go ahead and do it so we allowed all this time to shoot that and then in like the third try it was sort of so complicated and worked so perfectly with at the end you know the carriages going out and all the drama and um uh, sir james martin coming out at the end um we had all this time before lunch so i said well let me get dramatic portrait shots of all those, these characters. We did these dramatic portrait shots in the wind. And then on Saturday, I came into the editing room and um, uh, the editor, Sophie Cora, um, took um, the sort of descriptions of the characters from the reading script of the film, because my Asian friend, Claire Best said, you really should have a dramatis personae uh, cast of characters at the beginning of the script for financiers reading it so they can follow the characters. So using Jane Austen's language, we had little descriptions. So um, Sophie had remembered that script. It wasn't sort of in the shooting script, but she remembered it and she took those and put them up that way. And that created that thing. But um, Chloe Sevigny and Stephen Fry had already finished their shoot. So we hunted for um, single shots of them um, from their coverage and cut that in and it looked terrible. Um, and so we did that iris effect around them to make it look like portraits, look like something intentional. So that's, you know, stealing something that um, Scorsese resurrected in Age of Innocence. And then later on, we see checks coming up for the letters and the poems which works, works really beautifully. The reason, the reason I say this is um, it's, it's rare that I, I have a chance to talk about a title designer outside of Saul Bass. But if I'm not mistaken, the person you used this works with Alex Ross Perry on films like Listen Up, Philip. Yes, uh, yes, Teddy, Teddy, Teddy uh, Blanks. Um, he's, he's a genius and uh, I started working with him on, he, he was dating on Greta Gerwig at some point. So we were recording Greta Gerwig singing the last song from um, Damsels in Distress, uh, things are, are looking up. And she came with Teddy and turns out he was a graphic designer. So I said, oh, we need a graphic designer. Uh, and so he worked on Damsels in Distress, Cosmopolitans, and, um, and this, and he's just terrific uh, doing that. But that idea also sort of came out, came in backwards. So we had a joke about, um, at the end, um, Justin Edwards had a lot playing Charles Vernon, had a line about her visage and um, spacing in the actual word. But it was a, a word that we would not know until we saw it. So I said, oh, why don't we put, it yes. yes. And then talking about, yes, talking about the French uh, origin of the word and um, so I said, let's put this poem on the screen so everyone's gonna get this joke. And then we also have the letter and that's probably Sophie's idea again to do that. My, the, our favorite thing is when, um, uh, when, when James Fleet repeats um, long, when he emphasizes the, writing long letters, we could just put the word long up. Uh, uh, so, so a lot of these, um, I mean, there are a lot of ideas in post-production and during the editing and I, I read now about people who don't edit their films until after they've finished. And gosh, that's a mistake because you can get so many ideas from the editing room, from the editor as you're going along. But that's quite interesting because from what I've read about your, your uh, 
approach to the actual shoot, you shoot very, very quickly, don't you? Lately, yes. And I found it much better um, because I was really indulged. Uh, the second shoot, Barcelona, was total chaos, but the um, Pesetta was declining, was dropping against the dollar. And so we were able to go on and on with this interminable shoot. It was tough on the actors. Um, but um, that was chaos. Um, then the third shoot, um, Castrock was pretty indulgent and, and let me to go on too long. And then um, we really helped again with the Euro going down against the dollar um, with, um, I've been really lucky in foreign currency transactions. That's the, <laughs> that's the secret of it all. Um, and so, but, but yes, um, with Damsels, we had to do a really tight shoot. Um, with no overtime, and that was terrific. Um, I found it just tr terrific experience to try to be that efficient, and and this was super efficient, even more so. Just 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 incredible, uh, and it was you know just 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 great to do something in twenty six days, and and just a five day week, total no overtime, um, so no one gets too tired, and um, it, it was really. Uh, and, and the experience of shooting in Dublin Supreme, the people are great. It was, it was That's just... amazing because uh, it, would, it would always strike me that making a period film is, is a much tougher proposition. I mean, I was totally intimidated by it, but um, I shouldn't have been because the people who were helping us were really experienced. And it's just, you call up the carriage company, you go look at the carriages and the, the fellows who take care of carriages, you put them in costumes from the 18th century, and they do look like 18th century people. And so um, it really was the easiest in a way um, because we had really experienced um, people working on the film who had done this kind of thing a lot before and they just knew what to do. And we were really helped by um, hiring a key crew person um, who then said, you know, when we were considering three people said, we'll take this one, you know, go with this one. It's worth paying this person more. Wait until this person is free. It'd be really, and so the sort of crew hired each other. Um, I guess maybe there weren't a lot, of, a lot of sort of higher budget films shooting at that time or something. So we got sort of this really good group. I've got a question from Simone from London. I really love the performance of Morford Clark. Um, I know this was one of her first film roles. Can you talk about the casting of her? Yes, and I'd like to brag about that because it took us so long. I mean, one of the sort of silver linings of not having your financing um, is sometimes you can have an incredibly long casting process. So we had a, like 18 months of casting off and on. And I think Morford was one of the, or Morford's the first person cast in the film. And it was her, it was the first film she was cast in, but then she shot a number of other things before we actually got up and running. And it really, um, the part was really underwritten. There really was much there. Um, and I'd been under this pressure since play Trevor Brown days to try to make Federico a bigger character. And um, it sort of helped me, you know, sort of write for her, seeing how well she was gonna play this. To, so we added things for, for Morpha, we added the scene in the church so we could put in a little sermon in the movie. At one point, there's a chance of getting maybe a Christian investor. So I said, okay, but they said that the film wasn't a Christian film. So I said, okay, I'll put some Christian stuff in. So I started thinking about all the commandments and the sermon in the church and all that. And it really helped us out. And the, uh, the, um, the Christian investor backed instead Scorsese's silence and, and lost a lot of money and regrets um, he didn't put someone in our film fund. <laughs> <laughs> um, just staying with uh, the casting, um, obviously you've worked with, with Kate before and also Chloe twice before. Um, did you have both of them in mind uh, at an early stage or was it something that you, you thought about later? Um, yes, early stage, because, you know, Kate was actually cast out of Jane Austen, this sort of Jane Austen, character for Last Days Disco. So it, it was watching Cold Comfort Farm derive from Emma that um, I thought she was so good and wrote her part in Disco for her and cast her just what we wanted. And then in this, when I saw Lady Susan, said, oh my gosh, this is the kind of thing Kate could play. When I started writing it, she was still too young to I think have considered a mother part. Um, and uh, 
it sort of became sort of a touchstone for me when I meet people and they'd say, you know, Kate would be really good in this. So um, Mike Goodrich at, at Protagonist said that Kate would be really good in it. So I went with Protagonist, Protagonist Picture Sales, Mike Goodrich. And then Colin Jones, who did the casting, he also said, you know, Kate Beckinsale would be great for Lady Susan. Colin Jones did the casting. And so, um, but you, there's this long sort of um, cycle in these things. So there's some other casting beforehand, but I always thought that this thing Kate could play really well. Um, and the thing, one of the wonderful things about her is, is her delivery and her ability to be charming and incredibly cruel. Um, but it, it, it just made me think listening to her and also um, especially the way that she spars off um, uh, Xavier Samuel. Um, this in, in many ways is kind of a period screwball comedy or, or perhaps not screwball comedy. Actually, it's more like um, sort of Preston Sturges. <laughs> well, these are nice things to say. Um, uh, I mean, she also is really smart. And uh, so I'm working alone and I don't necessarily have like a de development or department or some studio to sort of tell me to rewrite scenes and this doesn't make sense. Why do they have to go back and forth so many times? Isn't this repetitive? Um, I mean, some, I think in one of the financing entities, there was a development person who made some really helpful suggestions that I didn't realize they were helpful until I was editing. Um, but Kate really went over everything. I mean, I think she'd be getting her hair done and going over the script and sending me messages from her iPhone asking me questions. and why is she doing this and why is she doing that? And so that was in the sort of two months before we got to Dublin and it really helped. Um, I mean, it was nice having that time that we knew we weren't gonna shoot for you know a while. And um, so she doesn't just perform that day. She's also thinking about it months before. I've got two questions have come in. First is a good one from Indy from Nashville. Um, there's often a temptation for people to see Jane Austen as a romantic writer only, yet all of your films have an Austen-like quality. What do you think is the key to making a good Austen film or a good Austen adaptation? That's such a good question. I wish I knew. Um, I mean, Jane Austen sort of, it's, it's a love theme. It's, a, it, it, it's, it's ferocious pairing off but um, it's sort of anti-romantic. I mean, she's profoundly anti-romantic in her sensibility. And, and yet, of course, romantic everyone is. And um, so, um, I mean, I think an important thing in every aspect of writing generally is to be, try to be at eye level with um, the material and with the characters. So you're not, at all condescending or teaching them in a, in a way or, or modernizing them. I mean, you appreciate their insights and, um, and try to be truthful to them. It's really notable, um, for instance, the novel I wrote is really not for people who, wrote, who like Jane Austen from, the, from romantic films. That is, I found it that's not the right audience. <laughs> It's the people who like Jane Austen for the books and people like Jane Austen for the adaptations like our two different tribes. And yes, there's some people who like both, but generally if you like Jane Austen for the books, you're finding something different than you do the most of the adaptations of the romantic stories. Did you have any involvement at all with the Jane Austen Society while you were making the film or working on the book? I mean, they've been incredibly, the Jane Austen Societies have been incredibly, incredibly helpful worldwide helping the film get out and getting attention. I think it surprised the strip distributors, some marketing people, how helpful they've been. And I've gotten to be, sort of participate in their world and go to their meetings. Uh, there's a huge uh, annual jamboree um, in North America. Uh, it's absolutely fantastic. And all kinds of literary professor, literature professors come. And, and there, there are also people who want to dress up in the costumes at some party too. But, but they're really serious people and really appreciate Jane Austen. And if you're going to se select a nice group of people, that's probably the best kind of way of selecting them. I've got a question from Daniel from London. I know you're, the, you're also a reader of Tolstoy. Have you ever thought of adapting Tolstoy, perhaps one of his short stories? 
Yes, um, I have. Um, Childhood, Boyhood, Youth is the first told story we read, meaning my elder sister, brother-in-law, and we sort of went through our coming to uh, told story phase. And uh, Childhood, Boyhood, Youth has always sort of fascinated me. And I think there's a bit of Childhood, Boyhood, Youth in, um, in the films. I mean, I think that's, that's, that's an influence. Because um, mostly as a, as a writing filmmaker, you're with the writing. And so your writing masters are probably more important than film masters. I mean, you can admire Preston Sergis or all these other people, but it's really the writing process that um, you live with. So um, we're almost coming to an end, um, but uh, Last Days of Disco um, to Damsels in Distress was, was quite a long time. A shorter time from damsels in distress to love and friendship. What what's on the horizon that we can expect from the next Whit Stillman film? Well, I'm not sure if it'll be a film or or if I'll write something. Um, I, I, I find that for me, one of the worst things has been getting involved in television. It just it never works out for me. It just takes endless time, and it's kind of frustrating. Um, and so I want to sort of. I want to do one more th one thing in television that I have planned. And then I really want to do either novels or things that I can control the production, like small enough, small enough budget. I mean, it's very sad recently, the uh, filmmaker Lynn Shelton died and I was reading yeah. some of the things she said and it really reminded me of, you know, I'd really like to go back to just doing stuff that you can kind of get off the ground just between yourself and friends and some, you know, key investors to put in some money. Um, the way we did Metropolitan, the way we did Damsels in Distress. So the, the idea for both of those was to do, you know, a low budget movie. And I think the whole Mumblecore movement was very inspiring and on how you can go back and just, just do things and, and have them turn out pretty, I mean, I think what, what they've done has um, been great. Well, I'll keep my fingers crossed that we see something from you sooner rather than later. And um, thank you very much for joining us today, Whit. Thanks very much. Take care. Thank you. Bye. If you haven't seen Love and Friendship, it is now available to watch on Curzon Home Cinema. Uh, we've got some events coming up over the course of the next week. First of all, on Monday, the 25th of May at 8.30, uh, the county director, Grimmer Hakan Larsen, uh, will be in conversation with me. Um, he previously directed the brilliant film Rams uh, from Iceland, and his new film opens on Friday, so you can see it in advance before that conversation on Monday night. Then on Wednesday, the 27th of May at 8.30, the director of Only You, Harry Woodliffe, will be in conversation. And whilst those two are taking place, starting this Friday on the 22nd of May and running for two weeks till Friday the 5th of June is the Human Rights Watch Film Festival, which was meant to unfold a couple of weeks ago at Curzon Soho Cinema. Obviously, unfortunately, it was canceled because of the coronavirus, but that's now moved online and there are going to be nine films over that, screening over that two week period. And if you go to the Human Rights Watch Film Festival website, sign up to their email, you will get details of Q and A's that we believe are going to be following all of those screenings over the course of the next two weeks. So do look out for those. And finally, a recommendation of the week, um, the wonderful Mark Cousins, who has made many films and many documentaries about film, including the epic short story of film, has come out with a new epic. It's Women Make Film. It's in five parts on Curzon Home Cinema. It runs for a total of 14 hours across 14 parts and it is an extraordinary history of the role that women have played both uh, behind the camera as practitioners across the whole of the industry since the inception of film. And Mark travels the world looking at filmmakers and film pra uh, practitioners all around the globe over the last 125 years. It's an absolutely superb piece of filmmaking. And at 14 hours long, you currently have the time to watch it. Uh, thank you for joining me and I hope to see you again soon. Take care, bye bye.